Hello, everybody. Just give it a couple Hello, minutes. Everyone. Roll in here. Hey, Randall. It's been too long. This meeting is being recorded. Link to the notes in the chat here. Feel free to go put yourself in uh, the list of folks that have attended today. If you'd like. through we got Dan, Ava, Josh, Luke, Krobe, myself. We have Tac Quorum just missing Abhishek. So we'll wait one more minute and then get going. All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, first on today's agenda, we have an uh, update from the best practices working group uh, from Crobe. So see so you've got some slides linked in the notes there. Um, I will copy that link and put them in that in case folks want to see them. But with that, Crobe, go ahead and take us away. Hey everybody, this is our periodic update from the best working group. Uh, currently, to uh, give you a, a brief update, our current projects are working on a source code management best practices uh, guide. Uh, we are also working on a C and C++ compiler options hardening best practices guide. Uh, we uh, continue to see progress on the education SIG mobilization plan, and we have newly created a DE&I subcommittee to focus in on the educational uh, needs of historically underserved uh, communities. And some awesome news, we got a great set of updates from our scorecards team. Uh, the API is now GA. Uh, the scorecards badge is being displayed in over 500 open source projects, including such critical projects as TensorFlow and Apache Commons. So that's the high level uh, notes. Uh, as you may know, we are a group that is uh, focused on providing open source developers with best practice recommendations and easy ways to learn and apply them. We focus in on three main areas of focus, identifying good practices, uh, providing ways to learn about those good practices, and then ways to adopt those good practices. We meet uh, every two weeks. There's about 18 or so of us that regularly meet, plus a uh, galaxy of about 20 other folks that pop in from time to time. Uh, I mentioned the uh, concise guides, which is what uh, we are currently working on for source code management in C and C++. We are having, a, we need to find some more information about one of our member sub-projects, uh, CRE, the Common Requirements Enumeration. They are technically an OWASP project that we collaborate with quite a bit. And uh, OWASP is uh, going through some uh, changes right now. So I just wanna make sure I need to reach out to the maintainers of the project and kind of get an update if they're still interested in collaborating with us or if they are the part stage where they want to retire. Uh, education SIG. 
the uh, plan has been uh, reviewed by the TAC and is on its way to be reviewed by uh, assorted uh, governing board potential donators. Uh, there's still time. If you're curious to provide feedback to the plan, uh, you could hop on uh, TAC issue 134 and provide your feedback on it or questions. That would be uh, super groovy. Uh, best practices badge. Uh, Mr. Wheeler has had a ton of stuff going on. And really what he wanted to highlight to the TAC um, is, do we want to explore the idea of encouraging OpenSSF projects to go through the best practices badge process and attain a badge? And we have a similar question for the scorecards, which we'll get to in a slide or two. Oh, look at that, a one slide. Um, so again, the scorecards team is curious. Do you want to uh, encourage OpenSSF projects to plug into the scorecards, get graded, and potentially take actions to improve their security posture? Um, we have an actual request around uh, managing um, a domain. We would like to try to uh, transfer some ownership of securityscorecards.dev over to the foundation so that we get things routed effectively. I'll create an issue uh, around that so the TAC can uh, converse on that. The uh, Secure Developer Fundamentals course, um, right now there is nothing needed. You can see some speeds and feeds of uh, what folks, we've had over 14,000 people enroll. Um, we currently had, uh, in the summer we announced, or this fall we announced we did translations in the Japanese. And we actually have a member that will be trans translating the course content to both Hebrew and Arabic. I see Mr. Callaway has a question. Yeah, it was on the last slide. I didn't know whether you wanted it to talk about those points now or whether you want to finish the presentation. Sure. Do that. Let's do it now. All right. So I guess I read the first one of explore the idea that a project is required to use scorecards. Um, so I guess maybe looking at uh, virtually at uh, Dr. Wheeler, um, we do have a, as part of the PR 112 work that we did uh, last year, we did put in requirements that were commensurate with the badging levels from right. silver, bronze, silver, and gold versus sandbox incubated and graduated. So I guess the question is, um, you know, is use of scorecard mandated at a particular badge level? I don't recall that offhand. I, I don't think it is. Uh, I think for the yeah. best practice badge, the problem, is, the issue isn't, uh, anyway, we do have a, a formal policy about it. Let's just say that not everyone is doing it. So I think it's more a matter for that's an execution matter. Yeah, and it was not part of the, at least initial drafting of PR 112, not tied to project maturity levels. Um, I could easily imagine a sandbox project that already reaches a gold badge or a high score. Right? I, I don't think these are uh, necessarily gate kept in sync. Yeah. I guess Ava, the, may, I'm a little confused by your response because that doesn't necessarily align to my understanding. So maybe maybe I can restate it and see if we, this is something we, we just need to take offline or, or uh, we can do it here. My understanding is that there are, it is a gate to getting to a particular level in the sandbox to demonstrate that you have obtained the badge at that particular level. Are you saying that you understand that differently? We might be using the word badge differently as I think of those as maturity levels. Sandbox, incubating, graduated are maturity levels, not a score of zero to 10. Agreed, but I think... We had, uh, if I remember correctly, which I could be wrong, but I believe we had said if for a project to reach the state of incubated, for example, part of the requirements would be to get a get and demonstrate compliance with a badge at from the best practices or the um, the infrastructure level of silver, for example, or gold. Um, uh, so I can in order to chain that level. You had to do that as a prerequisite. I, guess I can very quickly go look up what we landed on. And if there are any outstanding PRs and come back to that, I don't want to keep uh, okay. C Rob from finishing his presentation. Yeah. Okay. That, that sounds good. Um, I guess to the point of the, the, that was raised in this bullet, if 
we believe that scorecard has value and we think that we would want to align that in a similar way. I guess the question I, I would go to is, is that something that we could naturally just tuck into the leveling of um, the gold, silver, bronze, or simply do we need to call out scorecard as a one-off requirement that would be a, a proposal to be discussed? So scorecards and badges are two separate projects. They are heavily related to each other, but they are uh, unique. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that pre prevents a project from doing both. So I think it would be entirely reasonable to say, hey, open SSF projects run scorecards. Now, you may get answers and say disagree or decide that the results aren't useful uh, for your particular circumstance. Uh, but that said, I think it's it, I think there's value in adding scorecards. Um, it is my by the way, I, uh, it is my recollection that various levels required various um, uh, best practices badge levels. Uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, uh, Ava's right. If a, a sandbox can can get a, go get a gold if it wants to. I mean that that wasn't a requirement, yeah. but uh, you know right. you, you you know exceeding requirements is always welcome. Of course, <laughs> there, there is a minimum bar set, but you are you are correct to recall that it's not the scorecard, which is a right. zero to ten. It is a badge, and right. to see other point, they are distinct. Um, so the uh, graduated tier does include the wording uh, at the link here that a project must follow security best practices, including having achieved a gold badge. Right. At that level. At graduated. Yep. You could do it sooner, but to graduate, you must meet that bar. Right. Yeah. And incubating requires silver. Yeah. And I don't, I don't remember if Sandbox has a requirement. That would have to be. Oh. I guess the, the spirit of why I'm bringing this up and spending time on it is I think this is a we need to be leading by example, in my opinion, and by expecting that projects are consumers of the projects that we have. And we when somebody goes to something in the open SSF namespace, they should see that as a shining example of what good looks like when it comes to the comprehensive things that we analyze with scorecards and badges. And to be clear, like I think there are it is a per project by per you know project decision around what's appropriate versus what's not but i think leading by example is one point here the second thing i think to to david to your your comment around the separation between scorecard and badging i think from a from an from a external perspective helping to reconcile that down so that we have a coherent statement as to what good looks like definitively and trying to make sure that that is clean and crisp and actionable is something that I would certainly be supportive of. So helping to reconcile that such that there's, you know, clear guidance and making, I'm not saying that it's unclear today, but having that consistent clear guidance is something I think we should be designing for um, at, a, yeah. at a foundation level. And I, I agree and, and in turn that we're applying it as projects uh, apply to join. Yeah. Yep, Tracy. Yeah, I was gonna say I've looked at both projects um, for a while and I think like having scorecards um, in use would be great. One thing that TAC would have to consider are like there's different types of things. So you might want to qualify which specific ones um, should people should run through. So I know not all projects kind of apply all the different things like, um, like the Eclipse Foundation did an analysis and they turned off certain ones for reasons that didn't apply to their projects. And the other thing, I guess, for the best practices working group, um, it feels like there is an overlap with scorecards and the badges and in the interest of driving for clarity across the community, if there's ways the two could start to kind of merge together, um, you know, badges could start having results as code and anything that overlaps that can come from scorecards gets redirected to scorecards. I think long-term it would be good to to have them on a, a path to just making sense holistically. If I may respond, because I lead the best practices badge and I also participate on the scorecards working group. Uh, we've actually talked about that. And in particular scorecards includes as one of its criteria, the best practices badge. Uh, but there's a fundamental problem with trying to merge them and set that they have completely um, diametrically different approaches. Um, the scorecards approach is designed to be completely automated. Um, you run it, 
you're done. There is nothing else you need to do. You do not have to be part of the project. You don't have to be involved in any way. The great advantage of that is that you can use it on any project. The big downside is that many of the results are wrong. Um, it often doesn't detect, you know, one of the requirements is static analysis tools. It doesn't detect most static analysis tools. It only works on GitHub. We are working on these things. Um, it often can't detect CICD pipelines. Um, and this is not a beat on scorecards, okay? I, I'm actually, I want to make, okay? Um, scorecards is trying to do in an automated way something that is very challenging to do. Historically, always tools have false positives and false negatives. It's kind of the nature of the beast. The best practices badge does have some automation, but a lot, of, but um, when it was designed originally, the focus was what is important, not what is automatable. So a vast number of things are not automatable and there's no reasonable way to automate them. So scorecards goes, how far can you go with pure automation? And best practices goes, how far can you go when you have interaction with a human? And they're really different approaches. So and what, so, I, I was just gonna ask, what automation does it have? I wasn't aware that. Uh, oh yeah, yeah um, for the questions, for, for the issues where it has automation, uh, you can go and look at the, this was probably an offline discussion, but there there is some automation where we could do it. Um, and we've tried to talk about, you know, maybe we could do a little more uh, the, the problem is one of resources at that point, but the reality is fundamentally the best practices badge criteria are focused on what was important, not what's automatable, and a lot of things are very challenging uh, to automate. And whereas scorecards, the primary goal is automation, how far can you go with pure automation? And right now people have found it valuable to be able to express that, you know what, this does this, that does that, and because they're different kinds of data sources, it's helpful to separate them. So that's how this is, you know, they're very different approaches for data inputs. Yeah, I'll still maintain, I think the places which can be automated could link directly to the sections in badges and, and, and just be automated. If you already have some existing automation, I think that's good. And it wouldn't be perfect, but I think from a user perspective, just showing how- I think we're getting a little off track here, folks. Yeah. Useful conversation, but maybe take it up in the working groups. We welcome anyone to come participate. That'd be great. Uh, uh, am I okay to proceed? Yep. All right. Uh, I was talking about the class. Um, again, we're translating to most recently Hebrew and Arabic. Uh, then we have SKF, which is our hands-on lab platform, uh, lots of activity going on, and we would love assistance from the TAC in getting word out as we are releasing a new platform. We just need help evangelizing that SKF is a thing, it's pretty cool, and can help developers learn secure development techniques. And uh, my question to the TAC as we summarize is, is this type of information you're interested in seeing in a periodic update? And is there any additional information on any of the sub projects the TAC would like to explore more in a future call? Thanks, Rob. Um, to answer your specific question, I, I think this style of update is is uh, is useful and impactful. I think specifically the call outs to say, hey, this is what you want the TAC to uh, adjudicate, I think is particularly beneficial. Um, I think to the last point that you said around the, the SKF framework, I guess we have, uh, Jennifer and Brian on the call. So if, in the sense of uh, awareness to, hey, we, we, we need some potential marketing support for this. Um, I guess any questions or comments, we can take some of that to offline, but I guess uh, any, anything quick. No, as, as they are ready, we would like just to help spread the good word. And I will reach out to Jennifer since she and I talk a lot. Thank you very much for the update. I would uh, make one sort of process suggestion for all of us in the TAC and working group leads going forward. Um, because your presentation had some specific asks in it, uh, which were great and super helpful, I would love to see that DAC uh, circulated a couple of days ahead of time, along with an email saying to the TAC, hey, here's a couple of questions we're going to ask. Let's make sure that everyone's prepped and has time to discuss them 
in case we need to make any decisions to support the project or working group. Great. And, and we did share the, ta the deck ahead of time. I will be better next time pointing out specific questions so that the tech can see that. And my, you know, my bad for missing that, but we'd love you to see a little highlight of, hey, here's the things we're going to ask you. All right. Um, there's no other questions on Probe's presentation. We have next on the agenda an update from the end user working group. So I'm not sure who's the representative who's going to be speaking on that behalf. Hey, that'll be me. Um, uh, at rather short notice, I'm afraid, uh, I was not aware that I would be on point for it. So this one's a little more informal. Uh, Crobe, I personally hate you for producing such a fantastic, enlightening, informative presentation in such a beautiful Jonathan format. the deck last week. Shh. Um, so what I'm going to do is do a sort of a verbal report, basically, because I'm doing this ad hoc, um, lay out some of the things we've been working on, uh, some of the issues that we're concerned about and what I'd like the TAC to think about. And I apologize, Ava, that we didn't signal this in advance uh, and also give you some, some sort of like working group news. Um, now, previously, we've reported to you about the taxonomy of supply chain attacks. Uh, that has been an ongoing effort uh, that is based on a paper, which I can link to in the chat after I finish talking, uh, which essentially laid out a preliminary taxonomy uh, of supply chain attacks, different sorts of things attackers can do. Now, we've been working on that to uh, expand it, generalize it, make it more robust, seek more feedback. We've also been looking at uh, outreach to other organizations who are interested in security matters and supply chain matters to make sure that we have a wide set of eyes on it. Um, we've also been testing it against existing data sets. Uh, Jonathan Meadows has gone through the InQtel attacks data set and essentially fed it through that taxonomy to see that it's successfully uh, you know, mutually exclusive and completely exhaustive. It's the sort of the goal for taxonomy. Um, we're also looking at the CNCF data set, I believe is the next one. So that's an ongoing effort um, happening in uh, a quasi sig basically an informal uh, side group that has been dipping in and out of different folks. The second big sort of project that we've been pursuing is developing reference architectures with guidance on what you need to go and look at uh, from the ever-growing menu of offerings from the OpenSSF. Uh, so one of the difficulties that end users face is they show up. There's about 50 different websites. Uh, there's about 500 standards. Uh, many working groups, many projects. Now, I want to give a shout out here to the fantastic work being done by the Diagrammer Society. Uh, Crobe attends the end users group, keeps us up to date with di what diagrammers are doing, and we see the diagrams as essential. Uh, and in that spirit, the architecture uh, guide is essentially to say, here is a reference architecture that will probably resemble at least uh, loosely what you have internally. Um, here is some guidance on where to go, what to do, who to talk to, what documents you can consume, what tools are available uh, to get you started. Um, so that's been um, been going along with, as well. There was uh, an effort that arose spontaneously in several groups. I think we've talked about it here in the past, um, which is uh, collecting data on a number of factors around software repositories, uh, particularly looking for malware uh, samples, looking for metadata so that researchers can essentially do cross ecosystem studies. Uh, at the moment, uh, every time a researcher comes in to do a supply chain study on language ecosystem or package ecosystem, they have to basically start from scratch and build all the apparatus themselves to do these kinds of studies. We know from previous studies that results in one ecosystem do not always generalize to other ecosystems. Um, so to ensure that we don't basically sort of like leave people behind or create misleading impressions of what actions should be taken, it's important to have a consolidated data store. It would also later on allow us to even potentially have, you know, guidance or assistance or warnings to package maintainers about campaigns appearing in one place that will eventually spread to others. Um, now that came out of the end users group, but it also spontaneously rose in the securing software repos group. And I believe it was identifying security threats had a similar idea called assimilation. Um, at the moment, uh, we've sort of centralized those efforts in securing software repos. Um, but I wanted to note that end users had uh, sort of made that transfer of interest. In terms of the things we're thinking about at the moment, um, 
I would say the big one that sort of came last week was the national cybersecurity policy. Uh, I know it's on everybody's agenda. It's a big deal. Um, there might be a while before legislation shows up, obviously, given the current, uh, shall we say, configuration of the US government uh, in its various branches. But um, it's, it's, it's out there now, like the word is out there. So definitely we want to make sure that uh, TAC is thinking about it and we'll be interested in what TAC's thinking will be. And we understand that it will necessarily evolve. The other thing that came up uh, recently was uh, an open source consumption manifesto, which has been worked on by Brian Fox at Zonotype. Uh, I will again put a link in the chat after I finish talking. Um, I'm looking for comments and feedback, but bearing in mind that a manifesto tries to be short and punchy. Um, it's essentially to motivate people to think uh, aggressively about their supply chain posture. Now, it's not meant to be a replacement or a substitute or anything like that for S2, C2, F, or Salsa for that matter. Uh, it's meant to be a motivational uh, document more than anything. Um, let me see what have I got up to. Okay, so the last thing I'll talk about is sort of a changing of the guard. Uh, Andrew Eichen is stepping down as vice chair of the group. He is going to be focusing on recruitment. That's where he feels he can have the greatest value and impact uh, for the NGS's working group, uh, which makes a lot of sense. He's, he's got a lot of contacts in a lot of industries and sectors. Um, I've put up my hand and um, been made vice chair or accepted as vice chair, I guess is a better way to put it. Uh, so I'll be doing that uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and that is pretty much it. I know it didn't come in a very convenient slides format. Again, I apologize. This this came upon me suddenly, uh, but I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks for the uh, the update, especially on short notice, Jacques. Uh, questions? I guess maybe one quick one. Any anything you need from the TAC in the short term? Um, I think the main thing in the short term I'd ask for is eyes on the OSS uh, consumption manifesto. As I said, I'll post the link in a minute. Um, and while not immediate, definitely in the long term, this this might even be a governing board matter. Uh, how the Open SSF is going to position itself uh, in view of the national cybersecurity policy. Um, and for those who are wondering, particularly the the interesting part is uh, that there is a discussion in that policy of changing liability. Um, so that companies cannot disclaim all liability for software they are on the hook for security work. Uh, and, and unless they do take sort of meaningful security uh, practices into account, um, they can't get into a safe harbor. Now that will require legislation to bring about. Uh, but the fact that it's, it's even been broached when you consider the decades of precedent for disclaiming all liability for software products and you know the, the economic structure that has formed around that um it's it's an earthquake uh, which will last for several years uh, i saw a hand go up but i don't see it anymore it's uh, uh me uh, and and I won't, this is a much longer conversation and something that uh lots of us are having and and folks on the uh, public policy committee are you know have been who have drafted comments to the european union cra and and um are, are going to be working up a um, a, a, at the very least, a blog post, I believe, for for us on the the cybersecurity strategy. Um, the topic of liability is is an important one. It is a little outside of the security uh, issues, uh, only in that um, it is it is a fundamental change to to licensing and 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 I think is a threat more generally speaking to open source uh, yes. software and the kind of social contract between producer and consumer of it. Yet it's a little bit something beyond what we alone uh, uh, can carry. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out the right way to position that um, with the other open source projects out there um, and uh, is is important, I think. Uh, and uh, actually, Mike Milinkovich at Eclipse has written quite a bit about this. Um, I think coming back to the open SSF, what it, uh, you know, in addition to trying to both with the CRA and with this, look for ways to, to push for fine tuning and what those requirements are. Um, the one silver lining to, to some of this might be that creating demand for the kinds of things that we've been advocating uh, for isn't a bad thing. If we are ready to say, here are the tools, here are the processes, here's the techniques to go and make adoption of these and conformance to whatever those requirements are as easy to do as possible. 
Um, I, that's, you know, we're kind of accelerating past the carrots and shifting the default straight to the sticks <laughs> portion of the adoption of, you know, the phases of adoption of, of security technologies. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think if we, there's an opportunity here, if we're able to show here's here's the, the minimum viable kind of way to go and be conformant um, uh, with the right combination of technologies from us, from other parts of the open source ecosystem, then um, we might move faster against all of the security objectives we all have. I, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, I, I do put an asterisk though, uh, and end users are mostly interested in, in this from an end users perspective, mm -hmm. uh, which is that we would like very much to be able to hold our suppliers to account for lax security practices. Uh, I wear both hats as an end user and, and as a person who works in the upstream. So I am definitely keen that they also don't kill the golden goose. Um, yeah. But I also don't want to derail the rest of tax discussions today. Yeah. I will, I will add a little comment, and that is I sit in a couple of these places, including in the OSI, the Open Source Initiative. Um, this question, both in the CRA and the NCS, is very broad and, as Brian said, affects all of open source. So I would expect in the OpenSSF, we're looking at it from the perspective of security and security tooling and implications thereon, not so much on the impact on open source, but that we would participate, as Brian said, working with other open source foundations to to build responses whether it's blog posts or otherwise on those issues thank you all right <clears throat> well thank you again jock uh, for the update appreciate the uh the dialogue all right next on the agenda chrome uh, mobilization plan proposals uh yeah i'm working with sam uh thank you to the tac for your initial review and uh, expression of support so we will be uh, creating some new artifacts to actually go in front of the potential funders uh, shortly. And my request to the TAC would be, we have two awesome plans out there. There's links to the issues. If you have any uh, feedback, uh, if anything is unclear about the plans, or if you'd like to see, uh, if you identify any gaps or have additional yeah. suggestions, please express those on those issues, please. That'd be super helpful, especially as we prepare for talking to the GB. All right. No, thanks for that, Krobe. Uh, any questions on that before we keep moving? All right, Krobe, you're back up again on the next item here around the Diagrammer Society. So Woo! I don't know how much time you were budgeting for this. I will note that we have one other item on the agenda, which is a new project request. So that may take up. Sometime. I'm going to go fast like Lightning McQueen. ka -chow. All right. Anyway. Uh, there is a group of us that get together and doodle on bar napkins. And we are here to show some of our work. Uh, the problem for this little SIG has been trying to solve uh, the fact that it's difficult to know what the foundation is doing and how to participate. Uh, so we assembled a group of folks, we get together and talk about how we might be able to solve that problem and provide uh, simple examples of how the organization is laid out, uh, talk about what the challenges the different working groups and SIGs are trying to solve and how those components relate to each other. Um, any, everybody's welcome. You can uh, hang out and draw pictures and have fun. And what we realized early on is there is not going to be any one picture that accurately describes all of the complexities and nuances of the work going on in the foundation. So we will have to produce uh, multiple artifacts. And we have just a, a blast through a series of uh, quick doodles and kind of talk about where we are. And uh, feedback is always welcome. Please, uh, all these diagrams are available in our repo. This dot, uh, PowerPoint is available in our repo. So if you're curious, you want to add your feedback, please let us know. Uh, first style is kind of a org chart style diagram that lays out tac tactically. There's the governing board at the top, the TAC reports to the governing board, the working groups report to the TAC. So this is very uh, useful to certain personas and certain viewers. And uh, for example, uh, a lot of the folks in the governing board found a lot of value out of this style diagram. And theoretically, you could take any of these work products um, work with a professional graphic designer and um, embellish them. So for example, if we had this diagram on our webpage, 
and you hovered over the best practices working group, it might link directly to that GitHub repository or if we had a website or show our top projects. Uh, next view is we call bubbles. Uh, basically, we can take a, uh, all the work within the working groups, all of the uh, SIGs and projects and uh, align them up. You could color code things to show a maturity level. You also can physically move the bubbles next to each other to show that the vulnerability disclosures working group works a lot with the end users working group because end users care about vulnerabilities, for example. Another view is a traditional SDLC model. You can take any kind of process and lay the foundation over top of it. And the cool thing about something like this is if you had, again, a professional artist, as you hovered over any of those bubbles, you could blow out and show uh, specific details and then hyperlink over to those assorted groups uh, output. Uh, something I'm having challenges with with my current tool is uh, what is affectionately called a racetrack. So you could take a DevSecOps infinity loop diagram showing the kind of seven uh, agreed upon stages of DevSecOpsing. And then you can racetrack over top the different working groups to show that, for example, developer best practices touches on all seven kind of phases of a DevSecOps life cycle. But um, the vulnerability disclosures working group may only touch upon release, configure, and monitor as a for example. And none of the placements of the example diagrams are finalized. If somebody likes a particular style, we would want to go engage with the working groups and confirm we kind of did our math right and their things are appropriately laid out. Uh, we have a, a mind map layout, which this was a very intense uh, deep dive looking at all of the assorted artifacts within the foundation. And uh, we discovered um, a lot of uh, duplication across the working groups and a lot of missing things like charters or readme MDs. So this style diagram is helpful if you wanna march group by group and kind of see how consistent we are, uh, kind of fun. Uh, we have uh, the ability to do things by persona. So as an open source developer, if I wanna learn how to write more secure code, we would route people to the developer best practices working group. But if that same developer wanted to understand about coordinated vulnerability disclosure, you can go to the Vulnerable Disclosure Working Group or maybe listen to what's going on with the open source CERT SIG, as a for example. Uh, we could line things up based off of the vision. You know, we had talked late last year about revising our uh, tax vision. So we could very easily take those four statements and line the working groups up and show which working groups are directly supporting which parts of that vision. Uh, we have the uh, stickers view, uh, back to my Lightning McQueen example. Um, this, you also will see this with the CNC uh, F landscape and the continuous delivery foundations landscape. So basically you can take like a plan, build, run category and show all the different working groups and throw a little badge up and be able to drill down to see what, how each of those apply to those particular areas and how to get information on more. Uh, then what was uh, very popular with both the uh, TAC GB governance committee and the governing board is laying the foundation over top of a CI CD uh, model. So you can see uh, moving from developer to consumer, seeing the little loop, you can plug in where the different working groups, projects and SIGs uh, impact different areas. So if you are concerned about uh, solving packaging security concerns, you, for example, could use something like Fresca as a for example. And finally, the uh, trail map, which you've seen the CNCF trail map, you could take a picture, a metaphor like a map and showcase your most important things that you wanna draw your participants and uh, outsiders to. Uh, haven't had time to get to this. If we want to do this, we need to spend a little more time and have a metaphor. So we could have the goose that lays the golden eggs as an example and have our projects be golden eggs. And as you crack them open and look at the treasure inside, you could be routed to like the salsa website as a for example. So uh, overall, did anyone like this work? Is there anything you saw that you were very excited about that you'd like to see further developed? 
or you'd like to contribute to, or are there different views that we haven't accounted for yet? And ideally, once we agree upon one or two of these pictures, we want to try to engage um, Jennifer and maybe get a professional graphic designer as opposed to some joker with a crayon. And then we want to make sure that everything's vetted through um, the lens of accessibility and usability so that we're making sure that the things aren't uh, you know, excluding people with uh, color blindness, for example. So that is that. Uh, are there any questions? or uh, feedback for us. Well, thanks for your time and let us know. We have a Slack channel, we have a repo, we love feedback. Thank you, thank you. I knew you were gonna work a Goose uh, reference in there somewhere, Krobe, so. Um, thanks, for, thanks for walking us through it. I think, again, just to quickly echo some of the feedback that Krobe mentioned. There's a subcommittee of the governing board um, that had reviewed this a couple of weeks back. And I think there was alignment around that, that uh, software development lifecycle view and trying to think about how it, it, it is a fundamentally complex problem, both from the end user perspective, as well as the software produce, producer perspective, as well as from an, you know, a, a member point of view, how to net this out. I think it is a, a multi-dimensional challenge. So while that, that one seemed to resonate the best there, I think there is a recognition of uh, we may need to will the whittle the countdown from you know double digit to single digit, but even then, uh, one one picture is probably not going to rule them all. So, if you have thoughts, I would encourage you. The Diagrammer Society meetings are definitely a fun time, so uh, I encourage you all to join. All right, with that, we have uh, one other topic on the agenda, uh, which is a new sandbox level request. Uh, it was PR one thirty seven. I did email this out. Uh, last week uh, for folks to take a look at it. I know there has been some discussion on the PR already, uh, but maybe just for helping the reset context for, for others. Um, I believe Joshua may be on the, on the line with us now as well, but Cairo and Zach, I think are also here uh, with context on the PR. So maybe just a couple minute overview of the ask and the project. Well, we can open, open it up for questions and uh, take it from there. So. Joshua, I don't, I'm assuming that's you on the plus four, four number, but uh, if not, that's me. all right, go ahead. Sure, yeah, uh, okay. So um, repository service for tough uh, is something that Cairo started basically based on um, observations of how invasive it was trying to implement um, PEP458, which is a repository signing uh, implementation using tough for the PyPI um, Python packaging index. And, uh, we kind of, or Cairo took a step back and saw that we were making fairly deep code changes with fairly um, like expert level required understanding of tough to uh, follow the logic and um, reason about the changes. And he took um, the, the, he came up with this idea for this project, which is basically to encapsulate all of that behind a much higher level REST API to enable anything that is doing something uh, kind of either in the first instance, um, repository signing kind of operations, but eventually we'd like to extend it to include developer signing uh, and potentially other features. Um, and the idea is really just to provide a service that's easier to integrate so that um, all, all kinds of artifact delivery workflows can offer this uh, sort of signing functionality um, that provides in the uh, initial efforts, our current focus is on tough. So we're providing kind of integrity and um, freshness guarantees and consistency guarantees. So that you're always getting a consistent view of the repository. Um, yeah, that may be, I don't know, uh, that TLDR may be too, too long still. Uh, so I'm going to pause and, and see if anyone has any questions, but that's kind of the brief history and context. Don't see any hands in the uh, in the Zoom call, Joshua. So I uh, actually I take that back. We have a hand up, Luke. Go ahead. Yeah. So so um, I would be supportive of this going ahead. I, I'm and this isn't in any way um, any sort of hurdle for us to get over. But I'm still trying to grok why the OpenSSF is better than maybe better is not the right word to use, but 
I'm just trying to think, is there advantages to everything being in the same location, GitHub org wise? And, and I'm, I'm assuming maybe OpenSSF because we perhaps have good wide outreach channels. I'm sure there's a good reason. I, I'm not, not sort of questioning that. I'm just trying to sort of get up to speed and understand myself. Yeah, so I think the two main reasons for, um, or two of the main reasons for OpenSF are the people we care about advocating to in the first instance are already here gathered under the Securing Software Repositories Working Group. Um, and the other factor is to uh, not make this seem like it's a, only a cloud native technology um, because there's nothing about Tough or the repository service for Tough which should restrict it to that audience and sure, you know, cloud yeah. is eating the world, but there's plenty of other software right. out there and it would benefit from this as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's a very good point. Yeah, and um, just just again, just for my own curiosity, so so would this be code or specs or both of the above or? Uh, it's code, uh, code and some um, comprehensive documentation. Uh, but yeah, it's um, Eric can speak to this better. But it's um, a set of microservices, effectively, with a REST API, and so you. Um, the documentation kind of describes the REST API and how to operate the service. Uh, and then you can make REST API calls to integrate this into your uh, artifact delivery flow. Yeah, we provide the containers uh, uh, images um, and also CLI command, but uh, the CLI is just an interface for the API. So right, people yeah. can also build other uh, on top of that. So Sounds to me. <laughs> Help me understand a little bit when you say this is not specific to cloud native, but you provide containers. How would I use this in a standalone fashion? No Kubernetes, no cloud, no containers. It's also possible because now we uh, the, we provide the containers uh, to make easy deployment. But from these uh, containers, uh, we are able to also provide, for example, a Python application that you could just deploy uh, in a bare metal machine. Uh, not running on top of containers or something like that. It's you just said, the first the, the first way that we decide to provide to use it. Does it does it currently have support in documentation or, or otherwise for a non-container based use? For now, our documentation is just explicit about how to run the containers, um, but it's possible also to run it as a standalone application uh, because. We just build the containers on top using our source code. We just add it inside the container. So basically, you can deploy it directly. Uh, Are there existing projects in the CNCF that I have to install to use our stuff? Uh, Python tough, I would say, uh, because Python tough okay. is the main dependence. Uh, for, for managing the tough repository. Uh, I mean, the, uh, managing the, the tough uh, metadata. But on top of this, we uh, use a different uh, resource together with the containers, for example, database, everything, because the, other, the, other, the choice to have as container image is to uh, achieve the possibility to scale it. When you think a uh, uh, repository with high, activity, for example, PyPI, the number of um, um, packages that are added uh, daily, we need to be able to scale it. So that was the decision made. Oh, let's first provide as uh, containers. Let's say that we choose PyPI and PEP458 as the first real case. But it also, uh, we, we noticed that it can be used for a small deployment as well. Let's say I'm have, I have a small company and I, need, I want to use the, but I don't have um, other resource to build it from scratch. It could also help those uh, small uh, organizations. All right, any other questions? All right, so if there's no other dialogue on it, I think looking at the, the chat that's been happening in the, um, in the PR itself, it's, 
it does not appear that there are any major outstanding uh, concerns. Um, so what I'd like to go ahead and propose that we go ahead and call for a vote uh, on this. Um, it, just confirming, looking at the list that we do continue to have quorum, Crobe, Luke, Ava, Dan, myself, Abhishek, uh, did I miss somebody? Josh, sorry, missed you, Josh. There you are. So I believe we have uh, we have quorum. Uh, if you want to go ahead and please use the check mark feature in Zoom or plus one in the chat. Either way, we can record this. But the meeting is recorded, so either way, we're we're fine. Uh, let's see. So we have uh, check marks from Krobe, Josh, Abhishek, myself, Dan. For what it's worth, I think you should use the approve feature of the pull on the pull requests. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I just want to make sure that in the discussion that we, if yeah, yeah. there's a chance for people that want to chat about this now, now is certainly the time. Yeah, I think I, I have more questions for the maintainers. Uh, in, in particular, what path do they see within the OpenSSF? Um, how they foresee engagement across the two foundations that We've had a, a brief discussion today. I'd love to have more engagement, uh, maybe sort of in office hours with the maintainers of the project where we can spend a dedicated amount of time chatting about that or a discussion in the Slack where we can take a little more time to explore. Uh, you know, joining a foundation is a big, a big step. Uh, I want everyone to go in with, with good intentions, open eyes on the same page and know how we as the tank can also support the project long-term. What are they expecting from us? Right. There's a, a questionnaire that Anne uh, Bertuccio and I developed a couple of years ago, but I'd love to see the kind of information that that questionnaire asks of projects be explored. We did this when Persia applied. We spent quite a while exploring it with them. I'd love to see the same kind of uh, dialogue. Uh, that is not, I, I'm not trying to put a roadblock here, uh, but I want to make sure that everyone is sort of very happy together uh, and, and knows what we're all getting uh, signing up for. Uh, I know that I don't right now. Uh, I don't see any reason to object to this, uh, but I also don't know that I understand what the project does, frankly. I, know, I feel like I understand tough pretty well, but RS tough, I'm not so sure that I do. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'd love to understand that before I vote on it. So I will abstain for today and I'll record my vote after I spend more time on it uh, in the GitHub PR. Okay, I see two hands up. Uh, Jacques, I believe you were first. Uh, before I start it, as a point of order, can I talk during a vote? Yeah, I called sure. on you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very quickly, um, there was a great RS Tef product uh, production. It was a production, but also a presentation uh, mm -hmm. to the Securing Software Repos group. Uh, I will dig out the session for you and, and post yeah. it in the notes. Fantastic. If there's a recording, I will definitely go watch that. Thank you. Brian? Uh, and just so I understand the um, hierarchy here is the the proposal is and the and the vote is to accept it um, as a new top level project comparable to six store or is it one that is within and managed by the securing software repos working group. My understanding and I'll ask the proposers to correct me if I'm wrong that this was uh, underneath the securing software repo working group which that's it, correct your January meeting they did vote on that to, to okay. be this. Okay. And, and, and I, I forget our process, but are we requiring TAC approval for every project under each working group? Or is it a courtesy? I think the approval here is to, to adopt it like it's uh, VMware want to, to donate the, the code okay. and copyright and so on. Um, right. No, I, in either in either path, we would, uh, um, you know, uh, confirm copyright. Uh, you know, do those those processes. It just, um, just in in the interest of process and structure, I was trying to figure out um, yeah. because I, we we have in the past allowed working groups to accept new projects and and SIGs within those working groups without requiring a vote at the TAC. And so, um, uh, just wanting to to understand the intent here. That is, that is a great question, Brian. I I assumed that this was uh, intended to be a top level project because it had come to the TAC. Uh, so okay, I'm glad that I, I, yep. I thought very, I was very 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 astute observation. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I asked. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, how do we resolve this? Sorry, I can't raise hands because I'm on a, a cell phone, but. Um, the documentation that exists for contributing projects to the OpenSSF doesn't 
talk about this past uh, these being different paths effectively right so um, we we want to contribute the project to the openness stuff uh, we don't have a, a strong feeling on whether it should be a top level project or not I, I suspect in terms of uh, scale and potential user base it doesn't necessarily make sense for it to be a top level project it's very well aligned with the securing software repositories working group um, so yeah that's kind of our, our position from the VMware side I think back to the comment earlier around using GitHub as the source of truth, uh, the file in the PR explicitly does list this as a project that would be sponsored and report into the Securing Software Repositories Working Group. So if we Thank want you. something different, we should have the source reflect the intent here. Jock, I see you talking, but I don't, I think you're on mute. Uh, David, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, I mean, my understanding has been, at least from past exercises, is the working groups can accept projects um, as long as it's within their scope, but they usually report up to the TAC to just notify and, you know, if there's an, some issue. Um, I have to admit, since there's a vote put, I, I kind of assumed, oh, top level project. <laughs> okay, so all right, so and, and, and that's fine. You know, okay, mis minor misunderstanding, not serious. I, I think there was some questions earlier on also about, wait a minute, there's some related CNCF projects we want to, you know, and so I, I think there was some extra discussion about that, and I think that led to this uh, minor confusion. Uh, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a brief tech, tech discussion to make sure there's no issues. So. You know, tally ho. <laughs> yeah, uh, to clarify my, my comments, if this is just within the working group and the working group says yes, then I appreciate the notice to the TAC, but I don't think we need to vote on it as a TAC. Um, yeah. If it's a top level project, then cue all of my comments about doing diligence and, and having a better, you know, deep dive. So for what it's worth, the governance structure uh, process says otherwise. It says to create a project, it should be submitted to the TAC but I don't know if that's what we intend. Yeah, that's a good point for the tactic to go clarify what that distinction is, I agree. Yep, yep. Tracy, note, it, note that we only have three minutes remaining in the call, please. Yeah, I think just to clarify, I think I followed the discussion. So since the project had been accepted by the working group, it is an open SSF project and we can consider this more a courtesy telling the TAC, but the, there's no need for the vote. Is that, is that correct? I, I think so. In that case, congratulations <laughs> to the Open SSF. Not sure, yeah, frankly. Well, how's this? We have a quorum right now of the TAC. The TAC can decide what that means. <laughs> well, based on my understanding, we had a vote of six in favor and one abstain. So unless I'm misreading that, I would move that we record that result in the notes and open a discussion to make sure that we, the TAC has clarity moving forward around this, this question. Seems yeah, let's a open it. Um, there. So. I think, I think right. the, the key thing is opening an issue to fix the documentation uh, about the project submission. All right. Well, that was the last item we had on the agenda for today. Um, thanks everybody for your attention and engagement and we will see everyone in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks all.